welcome to Perspectives, the APT's podcast which explores contemporary issues related to torture prevention and dignity in detention. I'm Valentina Cadello, APT Senior Advisor on Law and Advocacy, and this episode is the third in our series on the mandate's principles on effective interviewing, a new approach to prevent torture. The principles aim to end accusatory, coercive and confession-driven practices during investigations, practices we know can lead to torture and ill-treatment. In this podcast, we are delighted to share with you highlights from a special side event on the Mandate's principles, held in March 2022 as part of the 49th session of the Human Rights Council. The online event, which was co-sponsored by 15 states here in Geneva and attended by 100 people from all over the world, discussed the added value of the mandate's principles at different stages of the criminal justice system. The side event was also an opportunity to hear directly from experts and practitioners, including Juan Mendez, former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Solomon Arase, former Inspector General at the Nigeria Police Forces, and Luciano Maritz Maia, Associate Prosecutor General at the Office of the Prosecutor General of Brazil. Swiss Ambassador Jürg Lauper began proceedings with a clear statement about the urgent need to end torture and ill treatment, and how the mandate's principles can help achieve this. International law prohibits torture and ill treatment at all times and under all circumstances. Switzerland is committed to ensuring that this ban is upheld worldwide and supports monitoring and enforcement internationally. On the Mendes principles, Switzerland very much welcomes the efforts to make the work of law enforcement more efficient on the one hand and to strengthen compliance with human rights obligations on the other. The principles, on non-coercive interviewing address both of these objectives. Not only do they make law enforcement more efficient, they also have the potential to increase the public trust in the criminal justice system and law enforcement institutions. As you all know, torture, ill treatment or coercion are neither compatible with international human rights obligations, nor do they actually lead to better results in investigations. They produce false charges and may put innocent people in prison, while the real perpetrators may continue to walk free. Moreover, the police officers themselves are violating the law and public trust in the criminal justice system is damaged. Hence, developing appropriate principles for effective interviewing was a necessity. It is now up to states and relevant authorities, international organizations and civil society to implement them. We were delighted to have Ambassador Federico Villegas from Argentina address the side event. He took up this important theme of implementation and shared his commitment to use his term as President of the Human Rights Council to include the mandate's principles in the Council agenda in 2022. Let me tell you that we we need these uh, mandate's principles. We need to look at the mandate's principles from the Human Rights Council perspective in in two ways. The first way is the historical perspective, that we always have to think collectively what we are doing in the Council. We have a collective responsibility to move forward in the progressive development on all issues of human rights. And the human rights challenges are tremendous all over the world. But the same way that slavery was accepted and we decided as humanity to leave it behind the same way colonialism was accepted and we left it behind. Torture was also accepted and justified by the most developed nations in the world and by the most important jurists of the world. And what we did is a new social contract that that's not acceptable. And that's everything we have been doing in the last uh, decades on the fight against torture. And that is why the Mendes Principles puts us back uh, into that collective responsibility of progressive development uh, of human rights within 
the context of interrogation techniques within the context of uh, police and security uh, officers addressing a, a certain interrogation and not falling into uh, techniques that are clearly torture. Therefore, we think in the council that it's necessary to address this collective responsibility. And you have my support as chair of the council this year to put the Mendes principles in the agenda uh, in the different formats that we might have. And finally, I have a personal uh, comment that I cannot finish without mentioning it. What can I tell you? I, I've known uh, Juan Mendes at year. Argentine that has uh, gave such a tremendous legacy to the human rights all over the world. And for me, it's, a, uh, it's almost science fiction for me to be chairing the Human Rights Council and having Juan Mendes here, that I've only known him for 25 years, and, uh, and having and talking about the Mendes principle. So um, I think we are in, in very good hands if we have progressive development of human rights in this fight against torture with the Mendes principles as a new frontier on, on this. Representing Costa Rica, Ambassador Sara Duncan Villarubos highlighted the multidisciplinary nature of the Mendes principles, which integrate insights from psychology, investigations, human rights, and ethics. She also urged that the principles be implemented at the national level and that good practices be shared widely. This point on implementation and the crucial role of states in this process was reinforced by special guest speaker Juan Mendez, from whom the principles take their name. It was Professor Mendez himself who called for the development of principles on non-coercive interviewing during his time as Special Rapporteur on Torture and then oversaw their drafting between 2017 and 2021. And we will have the opportunity to hear more from him in another episode of our podcast. Ultimately, responsibility for implementation of this methodology lies with the highest authorities in each state. Central to the realization of the principles is a strategy to generate broad support for their development, for their eventual endorsement and implementation. We feel it is important to obtain an official statement of adoption, endorsement, or other form of support from the international community as represented by the United Nations. Effective human rights compliant interrogation and interviewing methods that reject coercive, accusatory, and certainly abusive methodologies and promote the building of rapport in a systematic manner are necessary and they are achievable. It is clear that there is growing momentum globally to shift away from confession-driven interrogation techniques to non-coercive interviewing methodologies. Adoption and implementation of the principles will play a critical role in this transformation and will constitute a significant step towards the elimination of torture and ill-treatment by authorities during interviews. This effort will require continued and robust support from the international community. With strong encouragement from the United Nations, the principles should then be incorporated into states' domestic laws, regulations, practices, and trainings. Ultimately, these principles will assist authorities around the world to improve the effectiveness and fairness of investigations. By moving away from a culture of accusatory, coercive, and confession-driven practices, states can draw upon the best practices that inspire the principles to ensure that the presumption of innocence is respected, that only guilty persons are convicted, that wrongly accused persons are freed, and that justice is served for victims and for society at large. Speaking from Nigeria, former Inspector General of Police Solomon Arase told the side event that the benefits of the mandate principles cannot be overemphasized. In addition to upholding human rights, there are clear economic benefits for their implementation. The more you keep somebody in custody, through torture, through confession, you are putting a lot of pressure on the scarce resources of states. The monies that should have been devoted to infrastructural and, and social amenities are now you know, diverted 
to keeping people in custody and feeding them. So that is one area where I think these principles will be very, very beneficial to uh, countries in this uh, African sub-region. And uh, that is why I am very, very uh, you know, anxious that we should be able to adopt this you know, approach to, uh, to law enforcement and see how we can you know, operationalize it. One of the difficulties most people have said is that most law enforcement officers not only in Africa, but globally, they always resist change. And uh, I know that uh, trying to bring these principles on board uh, will face some challenges, but I know once we are able to incorporate it into the training curriculum of most of the training institutions, I'm sure the first step you know, would have been achieved in trying to sharpen the knowledge, the competencies, the skills and attitudes of law enforcement officers towards dealing with issues of social disorder. Uh, the, the, the most important, the most effective way for, to, you know, we are going to use to get this thing properly done is through training, retraining, and training the trainers. And I'm sure that uh, in a very short while, uh, despite the resistance that uh, I anticipate from law enforcement officers who are already used to a certain pattern of doing their job, we will be able to get them out and, you know, in the end, you'll be very glad that they came across, you know, the, the, the principles. The third expert presenter at the side event, Luciano Maritz Maya, highlighted the added value of the mandate principles in supporting the proper administration of justice. He noted that in Brazil, there are times when torture will be used to obtain evidence or a confession, which is then presented to a court. And while Brazil legislation is clear that evidence or confessions obtained from torture are not admissible, the legislation also sets out the requirement to prove that torture has been used to gather this evidence. And then I say, who establishes that a statement has been made as a result of torture? Police investigation, prosecution, judiciary. And this is where I come and I have done that in a, in a research uh, in Brazil. I, this is exactly my, my PhD thesis, uh, which is the, the role of the judiciary to control torture. I've come to the conclusion that there are four U's, not for you, four letters U that characterizes torture. It is unseen, untold, uninvestigated, and unpunished. It's unseen because of the places where it takes. It's untold because it, it's not known by the outside world and no one inside comes to say. It's uninvestigated because normally law enforcement are involved in the, com in the commitment of the offense. So they do not investigate themselves. Then it goes unpunished. So what we have to do is to design policies to, to confront, to combat uh, uh, torture. And uh, uh, most of you know those principles, many principles uh, help to reduce frustration and stress, avoid disputes, reduce emotional arousal, neutralize peer pressure. We remove the excuses to, to obtain information or confession uh, uh, with the enforcement of torture or youth treatment. So we have to understand that the principles are a paradigm, a standard, and you, we, we have to train people and open mind to people to understand how to put them in force. Following the presentations, participants were invited to present questions to our panel of experts. After 90 minutes of excellent discussion, Cynthia Tukifio, representative of Ghana, concluded the side event by reminding government officials of the added value of the mandate's principles in supporting states meet the obligation under the UN Convention Against Torture, also known as UNCAT. This side event has shown us why the recently launched Mendes principles are a key instrument to advance human rights protection and strengthen the rule of law and the fair administration of justice, and more importantly, how they can assist our governments in moving away from confession-oriented interviewing techniques towards a reliable and accurate evidence-gathering methodology. As many of our governments present here today are parties to 
UNCUT, I would also like to remind you that two of UNCUT's key provisions are intrinsically linked with a successful implementation of the Mendes principles, namely the obligation to provide training on the prohibition against torture for law enforcement and public officials involved in custody, interrogation, and treatment of arrested and detained persons, as well as a requirement to keep under systemic review interrogation rules, instructions, methods, and practices with a view of preventing torture and other ill treatment. This is why integrating the Mendes principles in our domestic laws and regulations, policies, and practices can support and strengthen our domestic torture prevention and response efforts to allow for more effective uncut implementation. That was Cynthia Atukifio, representative of Ghana, one of the CTI core states. The side event was co-sponsored by the permanent missions of Argentina, Australia, Austria, Costa Rica, Luxembourg, Norway, Switzerland, Thailand, Uruguay, and CTI core states of Chile, Denmark, Fiji, Ghana, Indonesia, and Morocco. You can find out more about the Mendes Principles by visiting the website interviewingprinciples.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Perspectives. We'll be back soon with another episode in this series exploring the Mendes Principles. And if you have an idea for us to cover on Perspectives, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email on apt at apt.ch or find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to your company next time.